Greetings to all of you friends and members of First Presbyterian Church in Beaver Falls and Happy Easter. My name is Reverend Emily Miller and I'm the pastor here at First Presbyterian Church. I'm coming to you today recorded from our historic sanctuary and with me today is our organist Bruce Hayward and my husband Ed Miller who is filming for us on this Easter. Friends, I have never ever been in an empty sanctuary on Easter Sunday before, and I hope I never will be again. But despite all of the problems going on in our world right now, Jesus has risen from the tomb. He has risen indeed. And so, my friends, let's prepare our hearts for worship using our call to worship for this morning. Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised. So come with amazement. Come with joy. Come with wonder and praise. Shout the good news to all who will hear. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Won't you bow your heads with me for a word of prayer? Gracious God, we come to you today on this Easter Sunday, happy to watch you escape the tomb once again, but heavy in our hearts because we are not in our church home. We long to sing and shout your praise with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, be with us this day in our homes, in our apartments, and help us to open up our hearts to you anew with faith that is filled with resurrection. Like the women who came to the tomb on the first day of the week and found the tomb empty, we also have good news to tell. Good news to tell to ourselves in this time of crisis and good news to tell to one another. Forgive us, Lord, for our half-hearted witness in this time of fear. Forgive us when we let fear overtake the light of this Easter day. Forgive us when we think that maybe this year you will not rise from the grave. Fill us with a resurrected faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, our assurance of pardon on this Easter day is that familiar refrain, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. For through the life, death, and especially the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are always loved and we are always forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Members of First Presbyterian Church in Beaver Falls, will recall that throughout the time of Lent, we have been doing a sermon series that I have called Conversations with Christ. Throughout this time, we have been eavesdropping in on some wonderful talks that Jesus has had with biblical figures. We've heard about his talk with Nicodemus, with Mary and Martha, and last week we even uh, looked in, not really listened in, but looked in on Jesus' interaction with the donkey on Palm Sunday. All of these conversations, as wonderful as they are, all of these conversations, my friends, were merely lead-ins to today's conversation. They were precursors to today's conversation with Mary at the tomb. So let's see this morning how Matthew describes this conversation for us in his gospel. I'm going to be reading to you today from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Let's still our hearts now and listen for the word of the Lord. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven 
and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Friends, won't you bow your heads for a word of prayer with me? Gracious God, we do thank you for this Easter morning, and we thank you for this passage from Matthew that we have heard so many times in our lives. Lord, we ask this year for, for a special dose of your Holy Spirit to be with us, to truly allow this passage, this wonderful Easter message, this Easter story, this story of good news, to work its way into our hearts and into our lives so that we can respond with a resurrected faith. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, from my earliest days as a child, I've always been a fan of musical theater. I attribute this a lot to my mom, for from a very, very early age on, she would always buy those uh, CLO season tickets for us in the summertime to go together to see the productions in downtown Pittsburgh at Heinz Hall. Every summer, she would buy all six of the shows, and she and I would have our special outings, and we would go into town, and we would see them all. And then as I grew up and got a little more mature and, you know, could behave myself, uh, my mother treated me to a trip to New York City every year. We would go around her birthday and my birthday, and we would go to New York, and we would see, well, typically, two shows together have a nice meal, and, and just make a girl's weekend out of it. And as you can imagine, growing up, doing all of that, I saw quite a few shows. But without question, my favorite show of all as a kid was always The Wizard of Oz. I loved how Dorothy and her little dog Toto were swept up in that tornado and carried off to Oz. I loved how she landed there and she made friends with the Scarecrow and, and the Tin Man and the Cowardly Lion. But I was always most fascinated by the two female characters in Oz, uh, the ones who represented good and evil in our lives. Of course, I am referring to Glinda the Good Witch, who was always dressed in white with with little sparklies all over her outfit, and Elphaba, the bad witch, who was green with a pointy nose and a pointy black hat and a flowing black dress. Their interactions with Dorothy were supposed to exemplify the good and the evil influences on our, all of our lives, uh, as if things could be that simple, right? Good or evil, one or the other. But then along came a man named Gregory Maguire who wrote a book about the Wizard of Oz. He wrote a, a retelling or a reimagining, if you will, and he wrote it from the viewpoint of Elphaba, the Wicked Witch of the West. Of course, all you musical theater buffs out there know that that book was then taken and 
made into one of the most famous Broadway musicals of all time called Wicked. In Wicked, we learned all about Elphaba, all about what made her tick. And it seems that this good versus evil dichotomy in The Wizard of Oz wasn't that simple at all. I mean, maybe Glinda uh, wasn't really all that good all the time. And maybe, just maybe, Elphaba wasn't really so bad. Maybe she was just misunderstood. Now, I could spend all day describing the twists and turns of the plot of the musical Wicked or the book, for there are many characters and it goes in all sorts of directions, but suffice it to say that the main point of the show is that Elphaba really is a good person inside. She is just simply misunderstood. Her circumstances and her actions throughout her life cause this continued misunderstanding. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, she was green, right? She was born green because of a, a potion that her mother drank while her mother was pregnant. She wasn't green because all of her evil in her was just bubbling up and boiling over and turning her green, heavens no. She was disliked in her family, belittled by her father, again, not because of anything bad that she did, but because her father knew that she was actually the daughter of another man. She was disliked by her schoolmates, again, not because she did anything particularly wrong, but because she was green and she really didn't understand how to be popular. And later on in life, she was also disliked by the authorities of Oz. Again, not because she did anything horrible, but because she spoke up for the outcasts and the oppressed in society. There was simply nothing in her at all that was worse than you or me, right? Than any other person. She was simply misunderstood. Now, why in the world would I talk about The Wizard of Oz on this Easter morning? Well, many of you out there watching this have, have heard many Pastor Emily sermons, and you know, you know that I always tie it all together in the end, and I will do the same today, so just bear with me for a moment. For it is indeed Easter Sunday, and our scripture passage from Matthew 28 uh, is the Easter story. It is without a doubt the most famous story in our Bibles. And as they say, even, even secular folks out there say that this story, the story we heard today, is the greatest story ever told. In fact, it forms the basis of our faith. And in Matthew's Gospel, it goes like this. Mary and another woman, they go to the tomb where Jesus was laid on that very first Easter morning. Of course, this is right after Jesus was brutally tortured and publicly executed. So Mary goes to the tomb early on Sunday morning, and she expects to see the tomb closed up. But instead, according to Matthew, she sees this beautiful white angel there, and the ground is shaking and trembling as the big stone is rolled away. And the angel speaks to Mary. This is part of our conversation with Christ today. The angel speaks to her and says, Do not be afraid, for I know you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen just as he said. So go quickly and tell his disciples. And so Mary goes. She goes off to tell the, the disciples and on her way away from the tomb, she sees Jesus himself in the flesh standing there in front of her. And he says, greetings to her, just like I said to you a few minutes ago. He says, greetings. Do not be afraid, just like the angel did. Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And so... Mary does exactly as Jesus asks, and off she goes to tell the others. This is Easter, my friends. 
This is our story. This is the hallmark of our faith. This is a story that has been repeated over and over and over for thousands of years. This is the story that got me up out of bed this morning to preach to an empty sanctuary. It can feel kind of silly up here, but I do it for this story. And I'm sure, my friends, that it's what gets you out of bed every morning, too. Without this story of love and resurrection, there would be no Christian faith. Jesus rises up from the dead despite everything they did to him, despite the yelling of the crowds, despite the crown of thorns, despite being pierced in the side and publicly killed, he rises up from the grave. And Jesus rises up from the grave too. Today he does, despite our pandemic outside these doors, despite the economic crisis going on, despite all of it. He rises up from the grave. Friends, our God is a God of resurrection. He is not a God of sin. He has wiped out sin. He is not a God of death. He has wiped out death. He is a God who has conquered sin and death. He is a God of life. He always has been, and he always will be. Easter is the focus of God's people, and that's us, right? It is the focus of our lives. But I have to tell you, my friends, that it seems, it seems in, in the dark days of this pandemic, as folks uh, are letting the, their fear get the better of them, as folks are letting their stress and anxiety and isolation get the better of them, it seems that some of us have forgotten about Easter. It seems that some of us have, have let our fears run amok, have let our fears just get out of control, and no longer worship a God of, of life and resurrection, but who want to worship a God of death instead. And so, with greatest love and deepest, deepest affection for my fellow Christians out there, I I'd just like to address on this Easter morning uh, some of what I've been seeing from Christians during this pandemic. I'm sure you've seen it too. I go on social media, whether it be Twitter or Facebook or what have you, and sometimes I see from very, very well-meaning, well-intentioned Christians, posts that, that say or that infer somehow that our God has sent this coronavirus upon us as some sort of a retribution, some sort of punishment upon humanity for our sins for turning away from him, for rebelling against him, some sort of retribution. And I've seen this myself, I'm sure you have too, from some really, really good, devoted Christian people. My friends, the Bible is full of stories, as we all know. It is full of stories of God's interaction with people going way, way back thousands of years. And in our scripture, we see God rescuing his people time and time again. And we see God dealing with his wayward people in many different ways. But the most important interaction that God ever had with human people is when God sent himself, when God sent his son, Jesus, God incarnate, to be in the world. And when he did that, he sent his son Jesus not to reprimand the people that he met, but to love them, and then to suffer for them, and then to die for them on the cross. All that you ever need to know about God is, is in Matthew 28 that I read for you today. All that you ever need to know about God is seen in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you want to know, right, if you're sitting there at home and 
you want to know what God will do when he looks down upon all of the sins of humanity, and there are many, absolutely, then all you have to do is open up your Bibles and look at Holy Week and Easter, because it's right there for us, my friends. In our scripture, God did not ultimately punish mankind for our sins. He did the opposite, didn't he? He took our sins, and there are many, upon himself. And he suffered and died for us. He did not ask us to suffer for our own sins, as he could have. No, he suffered and he died for us. And that is the gospel. And on the third day, he rose up in, in the person of the resurrected Christ. And he gave us the very first Easter, and he still does this today. That is who God is, my friends. God is in the business of resurrection. We do not come here to worship a God of sin and suffering and death. We come here to worship the God of Easter. Friends, we are all scared during this pandemic, all of us. And it is understandable that sometimes we misunderstand what's going on. Sometimes we think that because somebody is green, that they're bad. And God, of course, has a long and storied history with his people, us, his people, who are constantly making mistakes. And over time, many, many people have written about this. You can go to Barnes & Noble online and find all of the books, all of the books claiming that God is a God of, of wrath because of this or that or the other thing, or, or that there is no God at all. Friends, this is old news, very, very old news, these kind of claims. It's been going on for years. But on this Easter morning, do not be fooled. Do not misunderstand a thing. Because on this Easter morning, we celebrate his resurrection. We celebrate our resurrection in him, our new life in him. So please do not misunderstand our God. Don't let our coronavirus fears and our uncertainty about what's going to happen in the future taint our view of God. His heart, my friends, is full of love. His heart is full of mercy. His heart is full of forgiveness. His heart is full of grace. And he shows us that on Easter. And then he asks us to go out and show that love to others. Misunderstandings can ruin our relationships with one another, and misunderstandings can ruin our faith with God. Don't let your faith be ruined this Easter, my friends. Let's honor Jesus' sacrifice this day, and let's proclaim his glory by proclaiming him for the God whom he is, a God of life and a God of resurrection. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Presbyterian hymnal, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. I'd like to remind all of the members and friends of First Presbyterian Church uh, that you can still uh, send in your church offerings by mailing them to the church. Or if you're out driving by, we do have our, our mailbox outside. Uh, please drop those off so that we can continue the ministry of First Presbyterian Church. Now I'd like to offer a short prayer for our offering. Gracious God, we know that you are a God of resurrection. And we ask now that you take our gifts and take our lives as well. Use them as part of your resurrection plan to bring life to our community in Beaver Falls and around the world. Bless our gifts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I also would like to remind everybody else to please continue sending your prayer requests into the church. Catherine accumulates those and, and she still puts out our list of prayer requests for members and friends of the church. I take those requests. I pray for them. I know the folks who receive them by email do as well. So please continue sending your prayer requests in. And with that thought, I ask you all to bow with me one more time for our prayers of the people. Resurrection God, giver of all life on earth, our hearts are joined together this day on Easter morning. Lord, we pray for newness in our hearts and in our community. We think of those folks in the Brighton nursing home who are suffering so much from this coronavirus. Oh, please bless them, Lord, and bring them healing. We pray for all of the health care workers and the vulnerable among us and pray for an end to this pandemic and the suffering it has wrought. We lift up those who strive to find a cure, a vaccine, or a new test so that more will not suffer. Guide their efforts, we pray, and give them the creative ingenuity that only you can give. We pray for folks who are still suffering from other illnesses as well that aren't making the news like the coronavirus. Like we pray for those who are receiving treatment for cancer right now, and we pray for their healing. Lord, we lift up those who have lost family members due to this virus, but have not been able to be with them as they pass. Lord, we seek your healing power this day. And Jesus, we lift up those who are lonely during this period of isolation, those who need groceries and other types of help as well, and we ask for your presence with them. And help us, Lord, touch us to reach out and help others as much as we can in Christian love. Lord, let our faith truly be born anew this Easter. And now let us join together as God's people as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for spending part of your Easter day with us. Go in peace, my friends. Go in joy. And remember that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. God bless you all. Amen.